Hey guys, welcome to this artificial intelligence course. So this session will be all about neural networks. We will start off by understanding what are neural networks, then we'll learn about activation functions, after which we'll understand the perceptron training algorithm. And finally, there'll be a quiz to recap what we've learned in today's session. Now, there are many ways of knitting the nodes of a neural network together. And each way results in a more or less complex behavior. Possibly the simplest of all topologies is the feedforward network. So when feedforward neural network signals flow in one direction without any loop in the signal paths. And typically artificial neural networks have a layered structure. The input layer picks up the input signals and passes them on to the next layer known as the hidden layer. And there can be more than one hidden layer in a neural network. And at last comes the output layer that delivers the result. Now. The first question to pop into your head would be, what is the inspiration behind these artificial neural networks? Well, the answer to that is the biological neural network of our brain. So let us first understand the architecture of our biological neuron. So as you can see in the slide, our biological neuron has these three main components. So we have the dendrite, the cell body and the axon. These dendrites receive the signals and the cell body processes these signals and the axon finally sends out these signals to other neurons. So just like the biological neuron, the artificial neuron has a number of input channels, a processing stage and one output that can fan out to multiple other artificial neurons. So now let's understand these artificial neurons in detail. These artificial neurons are the most fundamental units of deep neural network. It takes an input, processes it, passes it through an activation function and returns the output if the condition is met. Or else it will process it again until you get the correct output. And such type of artificial neurons is called as a perceptron. So they are basically like a linear model which is used for binary classification. So as the figure shows, we have x1, x2, x3 and going on till xn as inputs in the input layer. Now to which we add the weights and the bias that are randomly selected. So here we have W1, W2, W3 going on till WN as weights. So we multiply these weights with the corresponding inputs and add all the values together. And finally, we add bias to that sum. So this final sum is passed through an activation function, which finally gives us the output. So let us see this in detail. So here we have uh, three arrows which correspond to the three inputs coming into the network. Now for these three inputs, we have corresponding weights associated with them. So input one is associated with a weight of 0 0.7, input two is associated with a weight of 0 0.6 and input three is associated with a weight of 1.4. Now these inputs are multiplied with their respective weights and their sum is taken. So if the three inputs are x1, x2 and x3, the sum would be x1 into 0 0.7 plus x2 into 0 0.6 plus x3 into 1.4. And to the sum, we add an offset which is called as bias. So this bias is just a constant which is used for scaling purpose. Now let's understand the concept behind these weights. So these weights basically determine the relative importance of the inputs. So let's say we have two inputs, humidity and wearing a blue shirt. So here we can see that wearing a blue shirt has almost no correlation with the possibility of rainfall. So that is why the weight assigned to input X2 would be low in order to bring down its importance. Now let us see why do we need activation functions. So consider this scenario where you have two different classes. One class is represented with triangles and the other class is represented with circles. Now let's say I ask you guys to draw a linear decision boundary which can separate these two classes. So is that really possible? Can we draw a linear line which can segregate these two classes? Well, the answer is obviously no, isn't it? So let me tell you guys how can we do this. So we'll have to add a third dimension to create a linearly separable model, which is easy to deal with. So the logic is when you're going from 2D to 3D, you're making your equation non-linear. So with the third dimension, 
I have introduced non-linearity in our data, which helps in creating a linearly separable model. And in real-world situations, you don't always get linear problems. So you should know how to deal with non-linear problems as well. And this is where activation functions help us to convert the linear equation to non-linear form. So these activation functions bring in non-linear functional mappings between the input and the response variable. Their main purpose is to convert an input signal of a node in an artificial neural network to an output signal. And if we do not apply an activation function, then the output signal would just be a simple linear function. Now there are many types of activation functions and today we'll be discussing some of the widely used ones. So well, let's start with the identity function. So the identity function gives out the same output as the input. So no matter how many layers we have, if all the activations are identity functions, then the final output of the last layer would be the same as the input given to the first layer. And the range of the identity function goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So after that, we have the binary step function. So this binary step function is usually denoted by h or theta, and it is a discontinuous function. So if the input is less than zero, then the output would be zero. And if the input is equal to or greater than zero, then the output would be one. And this is why binary step function is used to solve a binary classification problem. So after that, we have the sigmoid function. So the formula for the sigmoid function is denoted by one upon one plus e power minus x. The sigmoid function basically scales the values between zero and one. So if the input is a large negative number, it is scaled towards zero. And similarly, if the input is a large positive number, it is scaled towards one. Then we have the tan h function. It is a hyperbolic trigonometric function which scales the values between minus one and one. So one advantage of tan h function over sigmoid is that it can deal more easily with negative numbers. And after that, we have the ReLU function, which stands for rectified linear unit. So this function will give out zero if input is less than zero. And on the other hand, if input is equal to or greater than zero, then it'll act as an identity function and give out the same value as the input. And this ReLU function is the most widely used activation function and is primarily implemented on the hidden layers of the neural network. Then we have the leaky ReLU, which is just a modified version of ReLU. So the leaky ReLU, instead of just completely removing the negative part, it just lowers the magnitude. And finally, we have the softmax function, which is ideally used in the output layer for classification problems. So the softmax function basically gives a set of probability values for each class of the output. And that particular class, which would have the maximum probability, will be our output class. So uh, that was all about activation functions. Now let us learn more about perceptrons. So like we were taught how to behave in certain conditions, perceptrons also require training. So they have a learning algorithm through which they produce the output. By training a perceptron, we try to find a line, plane, or some hyperplane, which can accurately separate these two classes by adjusting the weights and biases. So uh, consider this image where we give the dogs and horses as input. So here after the first iteration, error value is two, since the horse has been classified as dog, and there is one dog which is placed in the horse's class. And in the second iteration, the error value is reduced to one as it is just the dog which is classified as a horse. And finally, in the third iteration, we get the correct output as the positron has been trained well with no error. So all the dogs have been placed in one class and all the horses have been placed in one class. Now let's understand the perceptron training algorithm. So this perceptron over here receives multiple inputs and each input is initialized with a random weight. So after these, we uh, multiply these weights with their corresponding inputs and then we get the sum. Now this input is passed through the activation function, which would give us a non-linear output. 
So this process until here is known as feed forwarding. Now, if the output which we get is not optimum, we calculate the error in prediction and then go back and then update the weights and bias. So this process where we go from output to the input layer is known as backpropagation. And we keep on backpropagating until we get the desired output. So uh, that was the perceptron training algorithm. Now let's have a look at the benefits of using artificial neural networks. So the artificial neural networks can learn organically. This means an artificial neural network's outputs aren't limited entirely by inputs and results given to them initially by an expert system. So artificial neural networks have the ability to generalize their inputs. This ability is valuable for robotics and pattern recognition systems. Artificial neural networks also help in non-linear data processing. So non-linear systems have the capability of finding shortcuts to reach computationally expensive solutions. These systems can also infer connections between data points rather than waiting for records in a data source to be explicitly linked. This non-linear shortcut mechanism is fed into artificial neural networking which makes it valuable in commercial big data analysis. Artificial neural networks also have high potential for fault tolerance. When these networks are scaled across multiple machines and multiple servers, they are able to route around missing data or servers and nodes that can't communicate. And these artificial neural networks can also self-repair themselves. So if they are asked to find out specific data that is no longer communicating, these artificial neural networks can regenerate large amounts of data by inference and help in determining the node that is not working. This trait is useful for networks that require informing their users about the current state of the network and effectively results in a self-debugging and diagnosing network. Now let's head to the quiz. So this formula which you see, it denotes which activation function. Well, think about it and write down your answers in the comment section. And this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much for attending.